In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. I have always loved that story, of the, Jesus' miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, from a small child, you know, it's always the Bible stories or vacation Bible school when they have the posters up on your Sunday school wall and you see these masses of people sitting on the, on the hillside and you wonder when you're eight or nine or how the heck did 5,000 people get placed all in one spot. And that's, not, that's sort of beside the point, but I've always loved the story. And, and actually, I, I realized um, as I was thinking about it last night that one of the reasons I love this story now may possibly be informed by the Monty Python movies with Jesus and talking to the disciples and gathering everyone. Um, it, it, trying to think of 5,000 people in one place, although I will point out that it's 5,000 men plus women and children. <laughs> Likely more like 10,000 people, which just this vast, giant crowd of all these people who've heard about Jesus. I mean, there was no, there's no internet, there's no cables, there's no Morse code. These people have come from everywhere because they've heard the good news of God through Jesus Christ, and they are hungry to hear what he has to say to them because for their entire lives, they've never been told how worthy they are. And Jesus has told them over and over and over about their blessedness and about their value to God. Why, who wouldn't come from all over the place to be told that and to be told with such faith and, and conviction that they had, had to believe it? This is one of the miracle stories that actually shows up in all four of the Gospels. That doesn't always happen, but this is, an, this is a, a really important one. And then as I grew older and began studying it in seminary and sort of preaching on it and things like that, <clears throat> there are several different things, but the one that I have carried with me for all these years now is the theme that Jesus sort of shows to the disciples, um, this idea of living in abundance or living in scarcity. And most people back then, and frankly, most people today, over the course of the centuries, we tend to live in scarcity. We tend to want to claim what's ours and not want to give too much of it, whether that's our time, um, our, our, our money, um, the different things that we've been gifted with, we, need, we, we tend to want to hold on to them because we might need them one day. And if we give them away, then there's not going to be any for us. Which is opposite to what Jesus has always been teaching and modeling for what God did for us in the beginning. God created the world for us to live in. And God continues to bestow abundance upon the world and asks us through our own obedience and our faith to to live in that same kind of abundance. And, and I'm not being Pollyanna-ish and knowing that there's not great scarcity in the world and there are, you know, there's anxiety and there's fear and there's worry and there's all of that um, that, that's incredibly important that we, we sometimes we ought need to focus on. But even in the middle of that, God's abundant love is, uh, is pervasive through that. When I was in Lambeth, you know, some of y'all know I went to England last summer. <laughs> Only talk, preached about it about 12 times since I've been here. Um, we had the bishop's spouses met for 14 days every day for just us, Bible study, discussions, music, and things like that. And we had different speakers, and, and I realized very quickly that as a spouse in the Episcopal Church in the United States, in the Protestant Episcopal Church in the United States, that I, I have more abundance than most of the, I live in more abundance than most of the other um, bishops uh, in, around the world. And there was a woman from South Sudan, a, a bishop's spouse, and she spoke about just the life that she'd lived from always escaping, always not knowing what was coming next, always on the road, living in refugee camps, worried for her children. Um, one of her sons had been kidnapped two years prior. She had no idea where he was. Um, she could only live and hope that he was still alive somewhere. And as we're listening to this, I, I was struck not only by what could very well be a life that would deserve to be lived in scarcity because you don't know what's happening next, but her joy about being a Christian and her joy in knowing her, that God loved her no matter what brought me again back to this idea of abundance and that how God lives in our lives and, and wants to know us to know how beloved we are. So living in abundance and living in scarcity. Frankly, if I had the choice, I like the abundance part, knowing that, um, that there will always be something for me. 
that there's no need for me to hoard my time or hoard my talents or to hoard my, hoard my money because I have what I need and we're got called by God then to make sure that others do too. So all of that, you can see this is winding into a stewardship sermon, I know. But, um, but before I went to seminary, I worked in fundraising. I worked in development at the college, University of the South where I went to college, and then I worked um, as, in, even in youth director positions before seminary, learned about fundraising. And then in seminary, I worked in development. Um, and so in a priest and clergy, we all talk about not just fundraising, we use stewardship, how to be stewards of the gifts that God has given us. So my, my, enti- my background is steep. When I, when after Hurricane Katrina, I worked with um, congregations all over the country and all over the world, frankly, who gave us funds to help rebuild and the, both the ministries and the buildings that had been wiped off the face of the earth in Mississippi. I worked in planned giving, so I knew all the language. And so I was one, I, I'm telling the story I'm telling you was 12 or 13 years ago, maybe longer. Um, and I was writing um, an introduction to um, a stewardship uh, weekend that I had designed and was leading. And the story came up, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And I remember talking and thinking about abundance and scarcity and what a wonderful theme that is. And, and then I had this sort of light bulb moment. And I thought, God, I bet, I bet God's talking about that for me too. <laughs> Not just for me to preach about abundance in terms of returning to God those gifts that we've been given first when we talk about stewardship. I, Brian and I have always given something to the church from the time we were in seminary until this point. But what I realized in that moment is that we had always given out of what was left over at the end. I hadn't lived in that abundance. I'd been living more in scarcity in terms of what I believed or I thought the church needed because I needed, I had to do all of these things. And, and I, I, I know where I was. I know what was on the wall. I, I remember vividly that idea that I could live in abundance as well and that my first share, my first fruits would belong to God and to the church. And what would that, what would that look like? So I, I took a piece of a legal pad and I wrote tithe, 10% of mine and Brian's gross um, salary. And under that, I wrote groceries, student loans, automobile, school tuition, groceries, all of the different things. Um, and I knew when I got to the end that I'd be in, I'd be in the red, a thousand, couple thousand dollars. I was astonished when I wrote down every single item, every single th- thing that needed, to, needed my attention in terms of our money, and there was money left over at the end after giving first to God and then taking care of everything else afterward. And I was astonished because usually at the end of the month, we were scrabbling, you know, borrowing from Peter to pay Paul and that kind of thing. But I gave to God first, and, and it, all, it, all, it all worked out. And so ever since then, that's been our model of stewardship. Brian and I tithe 10% of our salaries from the very top, and then everything else seems to take care of itself. Sometimes better than other months, sometimes better than other years, but, but we are honored. We've been honored to make that leap and to know that the work, the, the blessings that God has given to us then can be used in our church to give blessings to people outside of the church and to develop and sustain the ministries of the congregations we were serving. So my 10% always goes to the church where I've been serving, and since Brian was bishop, his 10% gets sprinkled around to different churches around the diocese because he doesn't have a church. I mean, all the churches are Brian's, I suppose. Um, And so he contributes to capital campaigns, and he contributes to different needs at the various churches. And I've done the same thing when I did the same thing when I arrived at St. Stephen's last November. Um, I accepted the call to be your next rector in, in late October and then came to visit um, to look at the rectory and start measuring and meeting staff. And it was a wonderful couple of days. And I signed a pledge card right then for 2023. That was the, the, the first thing I wanted to do after I signed the, my letter of agreement. So I've signed a pledge for a uh, card for $11,000 for 2023, 10% of my gross income. And I remember someone at some point said, I don't, do you, don't, do you know much about California taxes? <laughs> Implying that it's been really, really hard to do that. And I said, well, I'll just have to see. I mean, I, I'm good. This, is, this is my commitment right now and we'll see how it goes. And I have been blessed beyond measure 
um, since I've been here, not because, just because I signed that pledge card, but because inside of me and in my heart and in my own faith, I know that the gifts that God has given me will be used for good in this church and in the world. And so next week on Celebration Sunday, and I've said you know, everyone should know this by now, there's going to be, there'll be a pledge card in your bulletin. And I, I know you've been thinking about it before, and I hope that you'll think about it from, if you haven't yet, before, between now and next Sunday. And just to remember about the abundance in your own life, the gifts that you've been given, not the least of which is this church, this faith community that supports us and welcomes and, and provides um, wonderful ministries from Altar Guild and Knitting Group and the choir and the outreach programs and the youth and children, all of these things that we, that we support so that we can return back into the world. Um, I am honored and excited and hopeful and really looking forward to next Sunday when we come to church, all of us, on the celebration Sunday to celebrate and give thanks for the gifts that God has given us and that we as a corporate family of faith will then present our gifts, our thanksgiving, our abundance on God's altar to be blessed and be used. In the gospel text, you'll notice that Jesus took the bread, he took it, he broke, blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it. We do that every single Sunday on the altar, I mean, at, at, at communion. And we'll be doing that with the gifts of our abundance. We'll take them, we'll, we'll, we'll use them, we'll bless them, and then we'll give them. I, I, I can't wait for you to be a part of this with me, and I can't wait to see all of the wonderful things we have in store for us in 2024. Living in abundance is a blessing, and it's a gift. I invite you to live in that world with me. Amen.